I was born six months before World War Two, and I was born in China. My parents escaped from Breslau, and in Shanghai, I would say that maybe half of the population that was refugees and that came from Germany came from Breslau. But in, in Breslau, they had what they called the Jüdische Hilfsverein, which translated means the Jewish Aid uh, Society. I think the decision was very smart uh, because it really rescued quite a lot of people. And many people were not prepared to, to leave Germany. Uh, my parents wanted out. And my mother went to the Jüdische Hilfsverein and tried to get money for my two brothers and my father. And she went to my paternal grandparents and they refused. I'd rather die in the gutter than go, go to, 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 to China. China did not have a good reputation at the time. And um, they never made it. They never got out. They were killed in Treblinka. My father's two brothers were killed in Treblinka. And I have a brother, one of the two brothers, that was left behind because they were hoping to get him to America. So he was sent to, to Berlin to a distant relative who was in an interfaith marriage. And my brother never made it out. Somebody saw him. He was living in hiding in Berlin. Somebody saw him and reported him to the Gestapo. And he was killed in Auschwitz, or murdered in Auschwitz, I should say. My mother's father was already dead, but my mother's mother, my grandmother, uh, also was reluctant to go. My mother really twisted her arm to come along. And so my parents, one of my brothers, uh, the youngest one of the two, and my grandmother made it to Shanghai. They went by ship on the Scharnhorst. And when my parents arrived by boat in Shanghai, at the pier they were separated by letters of the alphabet of their last name. So my grandmother's name was Neumann. My family's name was Seidel. And so my grandmother wound up on a truck and nobody knew where she was going. And so the first day when they finally were shipped to a, a, a camp, uh, they went looking for my grandmother. They were told how to go, where, they, where she might be. And one of the most, most touching stories probably at that point was they passed a gate somewhere with a Magan David, the Jewish star of David, on the gate. It turned out it was a synagogue. The only synagogue in that area of town. You know, when they, when they saw a synagogue, they, they embraced each other and started crying. They couldn't believe their luck to see that there's a synagogue where they could pray and, and find some way of communicating with God. It was a big, big thing because they had no hope. The German government took their nationality away, their citizenship. And so they were at the mercy of anybody that wanted to abuse them. At first, the, uh, the Jews were living everywhere in Shanghai, wherever they could find a bed, a cot. And once World War II broke out, after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese decided to create a ghetto. And that ghetto was about one square mile. They converted old warehouses into dormitories. And um, we lived in a little corner. We had a little corner with curtains, two curtains. We had a bunk bed and a crib for myself. We didn't have any kitchen table, so my mother took a suitcase, put it on its side, draped it with a cloth. That was our, our table. No baths, no, no showers, no nothing like that. We washed ourselves in a, in, a, in a little wash basin. And the toilets, the community toilets, were latrines about uh, maybe 100 yards away that you had to go. And there was like sitting on top of a trench. You would sit there crouched above the two sides of the, of the trench. Privacy went out the window in Shanghai. In, I lived with 28 people in one room. And everybody had a night pot under their table, uh, under their bed. And in the morning then, everybody went with the pot to the latrine. So we called it the parade of the golden pots, the golden honey pots. The, it's funny that despite the despair, there was a big sense of humor in the, in the ghetto and also tremendous amount of faith I've never seen that close a Jewish bond as I saw in Shanghai. For a long, long time, there was a blackout. We didn't get any news. We didn't know what was going on. The only thing we heard was Japanese newscasts and newscasts that were fed by the German government to the Japanese. 
But then the, the Americans finally arrived and started bombing Shanghai. And I remember some of the raids uh, in the middle of the night, um, the air raids, because um, outside of our corner, there was a big mirror about this half, a si half a size of a door. And we were sitting across from it on a wicker basket. And we saw all the traces, the, the, the light traces coming down from the planes so that they knew where to bomb because the Japanese had surrounded all the camps with all the artillery uh, equipment. And that's something very typical of dictatorships. They hide their, their, their main defenses among the population. That's what you heard last, last time when there was the Palestinian-Israeli war, this, this collateral damage which happened, right? Uh, and that's typical, but um, still, I think overall, the Japanese handled us with kid gloves. You know, to get out of the ghetto, you had to have a pass. So you had to go and see the governor of the area, or uh, captain, governor, whatever it was. His name was Goya. He was a little guy. He loved to play the violin. And if you came for a pass, he also loved beautiful women. He loved pretty women. And if you came for a pass, you had to stand outside for an hour in the grueling sun while he played the fiddle, like Nehru, you know, like, and then he wanted to hear, did you hear my, my, my playing the fiddle? What did it sound like? You figured we were the experts because we were German, you know, for the classical music, right? And uh, when he wanted to pass, he would jump on his desk because he was a very small guy, about four, four and a half feet. And if you didn't give the right response that he wanted, it slapped you in the face. So the, the Jews considered that cruel. I think it's minor, you know. Um, as I said, he also liked pretty women, so my father got slapped quite a lot. That tells you something about my mother. So when you got the pass, you could go out of the ghetto and maybe find jobs or sell something outside the ghetto. And there was a bridge in Shanghai which separated Hongqiu, which is where we lived, to the other concessions. There was a British concession, there was a French concession, was a, I think there was a Russian concession and a Japanese and a Chinese concession. And the reason that China, the refugees could get into Shanghai is there was anarchy. Nobody had control over who came in. So we could just slip in. And I would like to correct something that the Jews always say. The only ones that opened their doors for us was the Chinese. It's not true. The doors were pried open by the Japanese when they raided Nanking and invaded China. And it's also not true because Trujillo, the, the, the president of the Dominican Republic at the Evian Conference in 1936, um, which was called by President Roosevelt to debate what can we do about the Jewish problem in Germany. All the major countries that came stood up and said, it's terrible what's happening in, in, in Germany. It's unacceptable. How terrible. But sorry, we can't do anything for them. The only one that got up and said, I'll take 5,000 Jews was Rafael Trujillo from the Dominican Republic. My family was one of the last families, one of the last 30 people to leave Shanghai of the refugee commu uh, community. I always claimed that Shanghai was the sewer of the world. It was very unsanitary, very, very unsanitary. And the, co the condition, well, I didn't know any different. I was just born there. But later on, I, I realized how terrible it was, really. Of course, nothing in comparison to what the people that were murdered in, in the concentration camps went through. I was born in 41, and I left Shanghai in 52. Most of the refugees left between 47 and 48 from Shanghai. Uh, at that time, the state of Israel had just been uh, promulgated as a new, new state. And there were a couple of transport ships that took thousands of, of uh, refugees to Israel. Ports that came back were horrible reports. The beginnings of Israel were not very easy either. And my father had several fears. He had already lost one son in Auschwitz. The other one was in America. He would have been drafted into the Israeli army. And sooner or later, I would have also been drafted. 
and he was afraid that it's going to be the end of the family. And the, the hope of everybody in Shanghai was America, the Golden of Medina. And people were willing to do anything to get to America, but not everybody got there. And the Americans were very, very difficult getting, uh, giving us papers. You had to have a sponsor in America who would be responsible for if anything happened to you. They had to bring proof of their, their income. They had to do all kinds of stuff. And um, not everybody had any family members in, in America that could sponsor us. And finally, Hyas, I, th I think it was Hyas that did it. They got a whole communities to sponsor people, uh, like Cleveland, uh, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit. A lot of survivors in those cities. But America was not very forthcoming to help the Jews. The Holocaust has been a tremendous yoke around my neck. Even though I didn't experience it in the, in the concentration camps. But as I said before, Shanghai was no picnic either. You know, every day I have some, something happen to me, like somebody says, uh, do you want to eat this? This is two days old. I say, what difference does it make? I'm used to eat food that's seven days old. You know, what, what do you... Oh, but this is already half run. So cut off the rotten part and give it to me. <laughs> I'm not that, that fussy because of Shanghai. In Shanghai, you couldn't drink water from the tap. You had to boil water. If you wanted to have an apple, you had to boil it first in hot water. You didn't get water anyway. You had to go to the water store and buy boiled water. We didn't have any heating systems in the camps. I had an aunt. She was operated 19 times because she had worms, worms that came from the food. You know, people ask me, do you speak Chinese? I had very little uh, contact with the Chinese because I went to Jewish schools. First, there were three Jewish schools, then there was the British school. Two former missionaries opened up a private school and, and it was a couple of rooms, you know, three kids to every grade. But I tell you, the Jewish schools, man, they were terrific. Our, our exams were proctored by Cambridge University. And I think they were some of the best schools I ever saw in my life. And I learned a lot about Judaism from the Sephardic Jews which came to that school. The Sephardic Jews live Judaism. Can't even say they're religious like, let's say, Orthodox Jews are. It's a different, a different mentality. They, they live it day in, day out. And I have some Sephardic friends that I'll never forget in my life. But the Jewish story, there's not enough people that have told it. And most people that talk about the Holocaust only talk about their own experiences, the atrocities that happened to them. People are tired of hearing about atrocities. Nobody looks behind the, the stories. Every day, there's something to remind me. To remind me either of Shanghai or what happened in Germany. You know, we, sell it, we commemorate yard sites, which means the anniversary of a death and also the birth of a, a person. I don't know how many times a year I, li I light up my, my candle to commemorate somebody in my family that uh, you know, perished in the Holocaust.